Today, we're looking at the 2024 Marin DSX-1. This is one of five different versions of the DSX in the Marin lineup for 2024. This is a $1,449 bike in Canada or $9.99 in the States. Through the rest of the line in the DSXs, they go from $1,149 to $24.99 Canadian prices. I am going to show you all the details of this bike, give you some thoughts on uses, sizing, other things that should help you to make a good decision if you're considering this as your next bike. I'm Graham. This channel is Bike Bros. It is a bike shop from Cochrane, Alberta, Canada. We take a look at bikes like this. We'd like to show you all of the details, talk about the specifications, talk often about some fit or geometry, basically the things that if you went into a bike shop and had a really good salesperson, they should be able to tell you to help you to make a, a really good informed decision. We do these videos because we kept on hearing in our shop from people that the kind of information that we were offering seemed way more thorough than what a lot of other bike shops were offering, where somebody would just point a finger at a bike and go, do you like gray? and basically ask you if you want to buy that bike. So I'm Graham, this is Bike Bros. We're looking at the 2024 Marin DSX-1, a $1449 flat bar, rigid fork, hybrid, dual sport, um, basically a commuter, a flat bar gravel bike, a bike that's capable of a lot of things, and we're gonna talk about it. So with this being the Second of five bikes in the price point, there is one cheaper than it. A common question is going to be regarding uh, what is the difference between this and the base version, which they just call a DSX. And so there are gonna be two um, critical things regarding uh, the frame that are gonna mean something to you, or frame and fork. And then beyond that, it's gonna be components. So at first, the DSX has an aluminum fork, this is a carbon fork, which also gives us these mounting points here for any sort of um, different mounting system, front panniers or front bags, front racks that you might want to mount. Associated with that is the fact that this is a through axle on the fork, as well as that being a through axle on the frame. So the aluminum frame, in this case, they call it a Series 3 aluminum frame. Typically what that will mean is that it's a slightly more sophisticated aluminum tube set and the fact that they're incorporating through axles into that um, tube set or frame as a detail. So the big thing with this one is going to be the frame and fork. This does get a step up, a fairly noticeable step up in the uh, quality of drivetrain. Uh, and then above this one, you're just getting into fancier and fancier uh, drivetrain and brakes uh, mostly, while sticking with the same frame and fork just in different colors on those higher models being the DSX-2, DSX-3, DSX-FS. So um, if you're curious, frame is a big reason to step up to this one and fork and then getting that more rigid uh, solid mounting system of through axles. We're going to have a look at some details here. So on this bike we have a Shimano Dior 11 speed drivetrain and that is a 1x11. In this particular case, like the name for this bike, the DSX, that actually comes from the DS is stands for dual sport. The X stands for um, the X in one by drivetrain. So all these DSXs, they're gonna have one by drivetrain, meaning we just have a single chain ring on the front with narrow wide tooth profile. If you're looking at this bike and you think I like it, but I love the idea of having a front derailleur to make noise and frustrate me. There is also a bike in the Marin lineup called the Fairfax, which I would say takes this bike, uh, tones down the sort of all surface uh, 
capabilities a little bit, but it does a bit more of a traditional uh, two by drivetrain, at least on the Fairfax. So if you're thinking about a bike that's only gonna see pavement, um, this would still be good, but a Fairfax might be something that you would look at. Um, for us, a big reason that we sell this bike is it is one of the most requested bikes in our shop. Um, and the Fairfax was not, so it's pretty simple. On this one by 11 drivetrain, we have an 11 to 51 tooth cassette on here. So that's a pretty typical 11 speed drivetrain. What it essentially means to you is that that in combination with our cranks here or our chain ring with a 42 tooth narrow wide, you're going to get a very wide practical range of gears without having to have a front derailleur. On this rear derailleur, Dior being a mountain bike group set, one of the things it has on there is this thing is called the clutch. When the clutch is off in this position, you get a fair amount of um, springiness in this knuckle here. When the clutch is engaged, that becomes very stiff. This is a byproduct of mountain bike technology with the idea being that this clutch combined, combined with the narrow eyed chain ring profile there gives you a system that if you're going through really bumpy terrain, you're gonna be less uh, likely to bounce your chain off, um, which just makes for a really nice overall experience. Uh, for my riding on narrow wide on a gravel bike and on a mountain bike, um, losing your chain off the front chain ring or actually having it bounce off back here with things being well adjusted becomes extremely rare. So um, that is one of the nice things on this bike. This off position for the clutch, just so you know, when that's off and you get this flex, uh, the idea for this is so that when you have to take out an axle because you say got a flat tire or something, you're not battling all of that tension there. You would just shift down into your smallest gear there, uh, turn your clutch off, and then your wheel will come out relatively easily. We have 700C wheels on this bike. 700C is a shared, uh, rim diameter with uh, 29 inch wheels, which some people don't know. In this particular case, we have the WTB Riddler and this is a 45C tire. That means 45C is essentially meaning that this width here, if we put calipers on it, should be roughly 45 millimeters wide. So relatively wide. And if we look at our frame here, we have a pretty generous amount of room that we could probably get away with up to 47, maybe 50 C tires. By the time we're at 50 C, that is getting awfully close to a mountain bike 29 by 2.0 tire size. So this could become even more uh, rough road, uh, off road compatible by doing something with your tire width or tread. As I said, an aluminum frame, we do have the important threaded mounts here for uh, either f fenders and or a rear rack. On this seat stay bridge, we have a little threaded hole just underneath here. And that once again will give us a nice mounting spot for a uh, fender. We get a similar thing down there. That also gives you a spot to mount a kickstand if you want something annoying and uh, noisy to bounce around down there. And then we have pannier mounts just below the seat clamp here. So one of the distinctive things that we see on this bike is this uh, little gusset here. This was a shared feature between this um, DSX and the Gestalt X, which at one point um, looked like they essentially shared the same frame, just one would have flat handlebars, the other was dropped. And then also on the previous generation of uh, San Quentin mountain bikes, they also used this detail. This is the last bike in the lineup that's still using this. Um, and it's probably appropriate on this. Part of the reason that they do that is that it can help us to, to drop the top tube a little bit lower to give us just a little bit better standover height uh, and then still actually have some good support uh, for the seat tube there. We also have this interesting detail here which is this really flattened section of seat tube. That is to allow us to keep a relatively short chainstay length. That's that length from your rear axle to the center of your cranks. Helps you to keep that um, relatively short 
while still allowing some sort of mud clearance and the ability to run bigger tires. On the frame here, we see that we have this rubber plug. That is something that you could pop out. You have that and you have uh, an empty port up here at the top of your down tube. That means that this thing is actually dropper seat post compatible. So if you decided that you were gonna be riding this in rougher conditions, um, in the sort of uh, gravel world, droppers are becoming that much more common in the mountain bike world. They're pretty much ubiquitous because they're just such a functional, uh, functional thing to help you sort of negotiate different terrain um, that a dropper at least is compatible with this bike. The one thing to note is that your seat post diameter here is 27.2 millimeters as opposed to most mountain bikes being 30.9 or 31.6. So you don't have a pile of options to get droppers, but there are at least a couple different options for droppers for a bike like this. And then the one thing I would mention in regards to that is if we look at how far that goes before the frame starts to sort of cut in here, if you're down to a really small sized DSX, you're going to have to be really precise with your uh, seat post placement if you're trying to do a dropper especially because you just don't have a heck of a lot of insertion space there or room to adjust for saddle height. Um, we do see on a lot of people on this bike in smaller sizes that we're actually taking the stock seat post which is probably down to here in the frame anyways. If it's on a small sized frame we're having to chop the seat post just to be able to lower it far enough without getting it jammed into this section of the frame. We have water bottle mounts on the seat tube, on the down tube, so two different spots there. Um, a little bit of a dropped top tube, relatively generous uh, steer tube or head tube length on these bikes. Um, but that's still, I'll have something to mention there when we're talking about uh, fit of these bikes. Going back to the cranks, these are just an aluminum crank with a press fit 42 tooth narrow wide steel chainring on there. The one bummer of these I would say is that if you want to change your chainring side, you're basically, well, you are replacing your cranks to get a different chainring. When they're press fitted onto the uh, crank like this, you just don't get the ability to change out chainrings. If the gearing is fine for you, um, that shouldn't be an issue. It's just if you want to change the gearing, um, the fact that that is steel, that chainring at least means that you're not likely to be wearing out a front chainring anytime soon. So that shouldn't be a concern, the fact that it's not a replaceable chainring separately for the sake of wear and tear. Um, even under really high mileage, uh, I would guess that you'd be getting five years out of something like a, a steel narrow wide. We're on a traditional square taper bottom bracket. Some people get really overly concerned about the fact that this is a square taper bottom bracket. While yes, I would agree that a square taper is not desirable in the mountain bike world because if you jump or do things like that fairly often, it's relatively common that uh, people over time will end up basically rounding out their cranks and then you end up with loose crank arms that wanna fall off. That's not really the use for this sort of a bike anyway, so I don't think it's a big deterrent, but that would be one of the things for people that are um, really conscious of the quality of all the bits and pieces is that as you move up into the higher levels of this bike, you start getting into external bottom brackets, which are just a little bit of a nicer bottom bracket um, sort of construction for longevity of bearings, but then also a bit more sophisticated uh, two-piece crank design that you would get on those. Um, on this particular bike, we still have what looks like last year's OEM pedals. I believe this bike is supposed to be coming with the new Marin Oso um, composite pedals, which are a little bit of a higher quality pedal, I'd say, than this. So depending on what actually came spec on your bike, as we're still in a world this long after COVID, where in some cases we see specs um, not matching with online listings, um, if you get these ones, I would say probably likely you'd want to replace these relatively soon just to get a pedal with a little bit better traction on the pins. These are relatively short and being plastic, they can get slippery with damp feet. And also just it's a, you can see how not spinning that pedal is. Um, these plastic pedals like this on a lot of stock bikes tend to just have a 
pretty basic loose ball bearing design in time. Uh, so in time you can end up with pedals that don't want to spin great or actually start to develop play and they actually give you sort of a clunkety noise that makes your bike just sound and feel cheap. Um, I didn't look up the uh, on the rims the exact internal width because I don't think that Marin lists it, but I think you're in the neighborhood of about a 20 uh, millimeter internal width on those tires. So I mean up to sort of that uh, 700 by 47 C, something like that, I think you're probably going to be fine um, and still have a reasonable tire shape on there. Uh, I showed you that clearance around the chain stays and seat stays. You get similar sort of clearance on the front here, maybe a tad more. So getting up to a 47 or perhaps 50 C tire looks like a probable thing on here. Um, now one thing, these tires are set up with tubes, uh, obviously from the factory. You may be able to get away with a tire upgrade with converting these um, wheels to tubeless, though I don't think that they're specifically listed as tubeless compatible. All of the bikes will have a 70 millimeter long stem, so that is showing a little bit of the progressive geometry of this bike, the fact that it's designed with a little bit of a slacker head tube angle, meaning your front wheel is a little bit further out front um, than what a traditional sort of road or hybrid bike would be. In this particular case, this head tube angle is 69 and a half degrees. A lot of other hybrids that tend to just feel a little bit kind of herky-jerky and not that stable will have head tube angles in the 71 and a half, 72 degree um, range. So it's one of the things that I think is the magic behind why this is such a sought after bike is there's a really nice ride quality when your geometry is a little bit slacker in the front. It makes the bike um, a little bit more stable and feel like it kind of wants to carve around corners instead of feeling twitchy and like a small movement at your handlebars will have you turned around and heading where you came from. So this is a nice stable sort of a feel without getting ridiculous. The handlebars on here are 680 millimeters wide. Um, I would say a little bit on the narrow side for some people. And I would also say that a common thing that we've seen with people is that they want to put up on a handlebar with a little bit more rise to it because this bike can, to some people, feel a little bit low in the front end. Now the trade-off with that, that low front end, puts you in a little bit more of a power generating position that taller front end obviously puts you in a little bit more of an upright, comfortable position. So it's one of those things where there's not going to be an optimal stock setup because if they put high rise handlebars on this stock, half the people would go back down to a relatively flat bar like this and vice versa. In this case, you put a flat bar on and people want to put on say a 30 or 40 millimeter rise handlebar. So it's not a right or a wrong spec, just a thing to point out. Uh, the last bit on here, these are obviously going to be, this is a Dior trigger style shifter, exactly what we would expect to see there. The brakes are Tektro hydraulics. Uh, the Tektro hydraulics are proving to be uh, pretty reliable, long lasting without requiring a lot of maintenance or anything. I just find compared to the Shimano equivalent, they feel a little bit bricky, meaning that when they reach kind of the contact point here, it just feels like they stop instead of having a little bit of kind of a modulation feel there. But on a bike like this, not being a performance mountain bike, the important thing is they're hydraulics, so you're going to get that extra power. Um, that also means that you have an entirely closed in system, so if you're riding in an area with wet conditions sometimes, you're not going to get water inside a cable system, um, and they're just reliable. Uh, regarding the brakes. You are looking at a flat mount Tektro brake on there and then using 160 millimeter uh, Tektro rotors. The appearance of this, this being the new 2024, the old version of this DSX-1, which was basically the same spec as this, um, it was just a lighter sort of a putty gray kind of a color as opposed to this getting into quite a subdued, um, 
I don't know if you can see that there's actually sparkles in the paint, but this is just sort of a medium sparkly silver on here. So if you're somebody who doesn't like a super flashy bike, this probably fits you really well. If you are looking for some flash and if spending a bit more money is in your, uh, in your realm of possibilities, then stepping up from this DXX1 to the DSX2, you'll get some upgrades in drivetrain and brakes and you will also get a really nice uh, red color if I remember that bike correctly. So those are all the things regarding specifications on this bike. Like I said, um, for potential upgrades, I would say pedals and for the sake of comfort, people might want to put on a higher rise handlebar. Um, if somebody was going to be doing really long mileage, another thing, because this bike has such a broad uh, list of sort of appropriate riding styles from gravel to commuting to basically a pathway, paved pathway bike, it kind of fits nicely into all those things. If you were choosing to use a bike like this instead of using drop handlebars for some really long rides, I think this is still fully capable. Um, at $1,450, bucks, it's certainly better equipped than any $1,500 drop bar bike. But for the sake of hand comfort, I would say having a set of handlebar bar ends or something on here, just so you can get two pronounced hand positions, would be something that would really help your hand, arm, um, shoulder, upper back comfort overall. So bar ends still are definitely an applicable thing for some types of uses. Um, I'll also go back to my usual gripe. I hate uh, friction fit, just rubber grips like this. Um, so these kind of squishy, but kind of not. I mean, I would personally, if this was my bike, I would be putting on some lock-on grips just because I much prefer a lock-on grip to a fat yet kind of hard grip like these stock marine ones on here. Um, I'm going to touch on one thing regarding fit of this bike next, but it's going to mean me having to put this camera on a tripod for a moment and sitting on a bike just to talk about something to do with fit. So if fit is something that you're thinking about, the reason I'm mentioning this stuff about fit is because this is one of the bikes that we really get a lot of people questioning uh, how to fit on the bike and how to select the right size for them. So hopefully this will be helpful to you. So, as we talk about fit on here, one of the big things that it brings up is the idea that depending on your background, if you are a mountain biker or a road rider, this distance in here between the handlebars and the seat is either going to feel good, bad, or unusual to you um, on a size. And so for many people, I would say just think about the idea of considering two different sizes. If you really want a stretched out feel, so this distance from seat to handlebars to be quite long, you're gonna be wanting to step up in size. If you are looking for a little bit more of a relaxed, upright kind of a feel, you maybe stick more on the size that would be recommended for you. So test ride these bikes is gonna be very important. You want to get something where you can basically uh, choose your bike size based on this fit here. So I'm six foot one and I would likely go on to a size extra large, whereas for a lot of other bikes, I would probably be on a size large. Um, traditional sizing would sort of say size small would be up to about five foot um, five, five foot six, and then medium five six up to five ten large 510 to 61 and extra large bigger than 61. If you want a little bit more stretch between the saddle and the handlebars, you could almost just, if you fit into one category, just size yourself up into the next. But to be safe, I would say um, come into the shop if you happen to be in our area or go to your local Marin dealer so that you can try both sizes and size yourself based on this fit. The one other thing to remember with the fit then too is that with each frame size, as you step up in size, this distance changes, but also this head tube length will change as well. 
So you can actually get a taller handlebar by going up to a larger version of the bike. Um, so you're actually adjusting fit in more ways than just a reach. You're bringing handlebars up and moving them ahead if you are on a larger sized bike. So I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that because we get so many people who uh, ask us about strategies with fitting this bike. So one last thing I'll mention about this bike before I sign out. The way Marin talks about this on the Marin website, they basically they mention bike packing with this bike. I would say if bike packing is a primary um, goal for you, I personally, uh, unless you're just talking about day trips or maybe very lightly packed overnights, um, I personally think that this frame is a little bit light um, unless you happen to be an extremely lightweight rider yourself. Um, I would personally go up to something like the Marin Mirror Woods if I wanted to be mounting um, a bunch of bags and just a bunch of equipment to my bike. I think the mirror woods being a cromali frame and just the layout of the bike and the capacity to put larger tires on a mirror woods um, makes it a little bit more of a natural choice. I think the biggest strength for this bike is for somebody who has a mixed terrain commute or they want to go riding gravel and the allure of drop handlebars on sort of a quote unquote uh, gravel bike doesn't really mean that much to them. For practicality's sake, a lot of people I think would be perfectly happy riding gravel on a bike like this. It's only the people who are really pulled into gravel riding by the sort of romance of the drop handlebar aesthetic and you're gonna be going out on group rides and everybody looks like they're kind of athlete gravel riders, not just people who are out trying to ride some backcountry roads and single track just for the sake of doing it. Um, I think that this is a very practical layout in general, the DSX. So whether it's the DSX, the base model, which is around uh, 1100 bucks ish this one, or all the way up to the $2,500 fancy pants version, I think one of them would work very nicely for a lot of people if gravel is part of what they want to do, but they're also going to do some commuting, some pavement riding, some sort of crushed gravel type path riding. I think this is a great functional all around modern take on a hybrid bike that just rides a little bit more smoothly, a little bit um, more stable than a lot of the traditional dual sport hybrids. So I hope you found this useful. My name is Graham. The shop is Bike Bros. We're in Cochrane, Alberta, Canada. Um, if you're in the area, we'd love to talk to you about this. If you're not, hopefully this helps you to get some information that you can go to your local Marin dealer and uh, you'll have half of your questions answered uh, before you even walk in the front door. Thanks so much for watching. Do the uh, pressing, tickling of like and subscribe buttons. If you've made it this far, you're probably a bike geek, so it's probably worth um, checking out our channel a little bit further. Thanks for watching.